Hi, I'm Sam and welcome once again to 101 Facts. Today I'm going to introduce you to a friend of mine. He's a brutal secret agent with a taste for violence and a penchant for the luxury as he travels around the world taking down bad guys and seducing the ladies. What can I say? Opposites attract. His name is... Bond. 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 The name's Bond. My friends call me James Bond. I'm here to give you the official debrief on the world's favourite not-so-secret agent. Let's get our bondage on. This is 101 facts about James Bond. Number 1. James Bond is a character and a franchise that's been around since time began. Well, if you count 1953 as the dawn of time, that is, as that's when the first Bond book was released. Number 2. Yes, that's right, the Bond movies are based on a series of books written by Ian Fleming. Books! You remember those, right? Those big heavy things made of tree shavings that you can't even share on Reddit? What's the point of them? Number 3. These books were written by Ian Fleming, who wrote the first one, Casino Royale, in 1952. It was then published in 1953. He wrote it in his Jamaican villa, called Goldeneye. Remember that, it might come up again later. Number 4. Out of all the Bond books, four titles remain to be adapted into movies. These stories are called The Property of a Lady, The Hildebrand Rarity, Risico, and 007 in New York. I'm guessing in that last one he just finally takes a holiday or something. Number 5. James Bond wrote a book called Birds of the West Indies that covered 400 species of the feathery buggers from all over the Caribbean Sea. Oh no, oh sorry, I'm getting confused. That's the other James Bond, an ornithological author whose name Fleming picked for the titular agent's name. Number 6. Like most other human beings, Bond has two parents. Andrew Bond, a Scotsman, and Monique Delacroix, a Swiss lady, meaning the British icon isn't actually fully British at all. Number 7. Bond's birthday is said to be on the 11th of November, but sources differ between whether it's in 1920 or 1921. Still, Bond does look spry for a 95-ish year old, even though Roger Moore does look it a little bit in a view to a kill. Number 8. Following the release of Spectre in 2015, there will be 24 official Bond films, and two unofficial spin-offs that don't count in the continuity because reasons. Number 9! Over the course of the series, Bondy Boy has killed 362 people. He's done so using helicopters, Mr. electricity, and, uh, air? I mean, wow. You've, you've really got to give it to him there. Good work, good work. Number 10. Bond's drink of choice is a martini, which he likes served in the same way he likes to be woken up in the morning. Shaken, not stirred. Number 11. Originally, he was partial to a Vespa martini, a drink consisting of gin, vodka and wine that he himself invented. When Dr. No was being filmed, we'll get to that, don't worry, Smirnoff wanted to promote their vodka and so insisted that no gin was present at all. Hey, by the way, if you want to impress a bartender in the future, insist you want your drink shaken and not stirred. They'll love it, and they definitely would not have heard it before. Number 12. A common aspect of the Bond movies is James necking with ladies, and of course, treating them with the utmost respect. <clears throat> anyway, there have officially been 53 Bond girls. To be honest, with names like Plenty O'Toole and Honey Rider, it's lucky that occupation was there, really. Someone with the name Pussy Galore was never exactly going to be allowed to be a teacher, was she? Number 13. Bond has had over 75 implied sexual encounters. <laughs> Come on, James, catch up, mate. In locations varying from a bed to a space shuttle. Number 14. Bond has driven a lot of automobiles in his time, but the one he's most partial to owning for himself are Aston Martins. In the books, however, it was a Bentley 4.5 litre he had in his garage most often. Number 15. He's also able to drive tanks, mini yellow helicopters, icebergs, crocodiles, and, wow, jetpacks? It's 2015, why don't we all have these now? It would make my commute so much easier. Number 16. Q Branch has endowed Bond with enough gadgets over the years to make Inspector Gadget feel self-conscious. Among them are mobile telephones, I don't think they'll catch on, laser cameras, Dart gun watches and explosive toothpaste, which, to me, sounds like a dental accident waiting to happen. Number 17. James Bond has changed his face several times in his life, regenerating more times than a Time Lord going through an identity crisis. 007 actors have portrayed him on the big screen. Number 18. 007 actors, I hear you cry. But Sam, 
Sean Connery, George Lazenby, Roger Moore, Timothy Dalton, Pierce Brosnan and Daniel Craig adds up to six on my little fingers. Well, you're missing out David Niven, who portrayed a James Bond in the original Casino Royale in 1967, which, weirdly, was a comedy film. Number 19. I say a James Bond because there were more than one James Bonds in this original version of Casino Royale, because James Bond was a code name. This is now a popular fan theory amongst movie fans to explain the multiple Bond actors. However, there is a lot of canonical evidence to suggest this isn't the case. Number 20. Actor and part-time improvisational comedian Liam Neeson was wanted for James Bond, but he declined saying he had no interest in doing action movies. Which is strange, because now that's literally all he seems to do. I don't know, he must have a very particular set of skills or something. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Oh, yeah, thought so. Number 21. Christian Bale had also been asked to play Bond, but he declined, saying he'd already played a serial killer. I, for one, don't really know what he's talking about. Over the course of the series, Bondy Boy has killed 362 people. Oh, okay, fair enough. Number 22! The Bond franchise has taken a total of $6.2 billion in its worldwide box office takings. Doing the mathematics, that's about $17 million per on-screen kill. Wow, that's a lot of Benjamins. Number 23! The Bond films kick off with Thunderball, uh, Stop getting Bond wrong! Alright, Alan, sorry, my bad. Doctor No was the first of the series, released in 1962. Number 24. The budget for this film was $1.5 million, which is peanuts, really. Although, don't eat $1.5 million, as it will probably cause terrible indigestion. Number 25. Doctor No, Goldfinger, and From Russia With Love are all joint highest rated on Rotten Tomatoes, with a 96% approval rating. It must be that Connery touch. Not that touch. Number 26. That being said, Ian Fleming allegedly called the film dreadful. Simply dreadful. Number 27. The now iconic opening sequence was inspired by pointing a pinhole camera down the barrel of a real gun. That little fella walking and standing there isn't actually Sean Connery, but stuntman Bob Simmons. The sequence cost about $3,000. Adjusting for inflation to nowadays, that's about $59,000. That red paint must have been expensive. Number 28. Sean Connery is deathly afraid of spiders, so this sweat dripping scene was first shot with a glass screen between Connery and Rosie. That's the name of the tarantula, by the way. This looked too unrealistic, so they shot it again, this time using good old Bob Simmons. Number 29. Oh, also, this scene is ridiculous because a tarantula can't actually kill you. It can cause the same amount of pain as a bee sting, but little Rosie there is 0% deadly. It's a shame. She was nearly one of Bond's first femme fatales. Oh, Rosie. Number 30. According to the vegetable named producer Albert R. Broccoli, early drafts of the script had originally intended to reveal Dr. No to actually be a monkey. Yes, a monkey. An actual monkey. This would have been, perhaps, the greatest twist in cinematic history. Number 31. The next official movie was released in 1963, and it went by the name of From Russia With Love. This is said to be the favourite Bond film of Sean Connery, Timothy Dalton and Daniel Craig. Number 32. The original source novel featured a Soviet baddie organisation called Smirsh, but because the film was released at the height of the Cold War, producer Albert Broccoli decided to change this to an international baddie organisation called Spectre, to avoid any political overtones. Number 33. Foreign translations for this movie's title include Agent 007 is Hunted in Denmark, Love Greetings from Moscow in Germany, and, somewhat simplistically, 007 averted the spy plot for China. Number 34. The helicopter in the chase scene was actually a remote-controlled mini-helicopter. In fact, director Terence Young used a lot of props from his toy box in this film. In this scene, for example, Bond is firing a water pistol, and in this scene, Bond is actually being played by a teddy bear. Okay, those two may have been lies, but the helicopter thing is actually true, honestly. Number 35! Though it only takes up mere minutes of screen time, the Red Grant vs Bond Smackdown took three weeks to film. The actors also mainly did the fighting themselves. Number 36. The explosion in the boat scene of this film got very out of hand very quickly, and burnt one of the actor's eyelids, which is a terrifying thing I didn't even consider could happen until right now. Ugh. Number 37. Goldfinger gave his Midas touch to the silver screen in 1964. Number 38. This film marks the debut of a character with a definitely feline namesake, Percy Galore. 
Pussy was actually named after Ian Fleming's pet octopus and was almost renamed Kitty Glore in the US because apparently pussy can mean something rude. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know what. Hang on. Let me Google it. I'll just. Uh... Whoa. Whoa. Oh. Oh. OK. Bookmark. Number 39. Gart Fruber played the whole body, including finger, of Auric Goldfinger, but his lines were redubbed because his English wasn't that great. Number 40. Fletcher's drinking Dom Perignon 53, above a temperature of 38 degrees Fahrenheit. That's as bad as listening to the Beatles without earmuffs. Bond apparently doesn't like the Beatles. Number 41. In 1965, Thunderball was released and is worth a huge 550k this weekend. Oh, sorry, wrong Thunderball. Number 42. The title song is sung by Welsh grass enthusiast Tom Jones, but Johnny Cash also submitted a song for consideration, which was ultimately turned down. Number 43. Stuntman Bill Cummings Come on, stop laughing, that's a guy's name. Demanded an extra $450 to jump into the shark-infested pool. I'd add at least 25 zeros to the end of that number. Number 44. The budget for Thunderball was $9 million, which is more than the previous three movies combined. Number 45. 1967 saw the arrival of the frankly inaccurately titled You Only Live Twice. The screenplay was written by Charlie and the Chocolate Factory creator Roald Dahl. However, unlike some of his other work, no kids were horribly disfigured in this film. Number 46. The rocket cigarette gun did actually work. Perhaps best not to, you know, leave it lying around if that was the case. Number 47. This is the first film where we meet Dr. Evil- sorry, I mean Ernst Stavro Blofeld. His famous feline companion, not Pussy Galore, an actual cat, apparently became so scared by the noise being made while shooting the finale, it ran away and wasn't found for days. I like to imagine she found Rosie the Tarantula and became best friends. Ah. Number 48. This was actually allowed to happen. Number 49. In 1969, the Connery-flavoured Bond made his exit, and the George Lazenby loaded on Her Majesty's Secret Service burst onto the screen. Originally, the change was going to be explained with a plastic surgery excuse, but the producers decided not to comment on it at all and hoped the public wouldn't notice. This never happened to the other fella. Number 50. Bond is seeing being a cheeky young man and reading a copy of Playboy, for the articles I'm sure, like we all do. This is a reference to the fact that the book of On Her Majesty's Secret Service was serialised in Playboy. Number 51. Bit of a spoiler alert with this one, but Bond's wife Tracy gets a cap in her ass from a drive-by shooting. If Lazenby was to stay in the role for the sequel, they were originally going to drive off happily ever after into the sunset, and her death scene was going to be saved for the next movie. But instead, Tracy bites the dust in the closing scenes of this film. Number 52. Originally, the avalanche sequences were going to be shot in conjunction with the Swiss Army, who used man-made avalanches to avoid snow build-up. However, just before filming, an avalanche just happened anyway. Number 53. Diamonds Are Forever was released in 1971, for a few months rather than, you know, actually forever. Number 54. You may notice that Sean Connery is back in this film after his absence. In order to be convinced to come back, Sean Connery insisted on 12.5% on the film's gross, yes, in his contract. He earned a record smashing, at the time, $1.25 million, some of which he donated to his charity, Scottish International Education Trust. Smashing. Number 55. Connery's massive salary meant the effects budget had to be cut back. For example, this mud bath in the beginning is actually mashed potato. Wow, what a way to go. Number 56. This car goes through the alleyway on two wheels and then comes out again on the other two wheels. This reportedly happened because when they originally shot the exit from the alley, crowds of people came to gawp at the filming. They then re-recorded it later on with a different stuntman who did it on the wrong wheels, the bozo. They then added in a scene in the middle of the car changing wheels in the narrow alleyway, which is about as possible as Jennifer Lawrence not being my future wife, i.e. impossible. Number 57. 1973 saw Connery kick his Bond bucket and leave the franchise, for the moment, giving his seal of approval, or a yash to a new James Bond, Roger Moore, for Live and Let Die. Number 58. Moore's body took a medical beating during the production of this movie. As well as kidney stones and dysentery, he also cracked his teeth and twisted his knee in a boat stunt. And he still gets all the ladies. It's so unfair. Number 59. Snakes caused a coffin load of problems for everybody on set. 
Roger Moore, Jane Seymour and Baron Samady actor Geoffrey Holder all had phobias of snakes and the script supervisor even refused to be on set with them. The snakes, that is. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? Yep, you've got it, Bot. Wait a minute. Number 60. The crocodiles that Bond hot steps over were actually real, and the stunt was performed by Ross Kananga, the owner of the real life crocodile farm. I must urge you not to try this at home, though if you have crocodiles in your home, you probably have more urgent problems to be sorting out. Number 61. In 1974, we saw the arrival of the tanned, triple nippled man with the golden gun. Bond only actually kills one person in this movie, and that's Scaramanga, that man with the golden gun. Number 62. The golden gun in question is made out of a fountain pen, a cigarette lighter, a cigarette case, and a cufflink. Three of these golden guns were made, one of which Christopher Lee took with him on a publicity tour before it was seized by US customs officials, who probably just wanted it as a souvenir. Number 63. Phang Nha Bay in Thailand, where Scaramanga's beach house is located, is now known as James Bond Island. Nintendo, I mean number 64. The Spy Who Loved Me parachuted its way onto the big screen in 1977. The jump was actually nearly fatal because the skis nearly ripped a hole in the parachute. How weird, starting a film with Bond falling to his death. Oh. Number 65. Tech billionaire with a name like an aftershave, Elon Musk, bought the underwater Lotus Esprit to try and make a real life submarine car for his company Tesla Motors. So soon you could face a traffic jam due to a pile up on the Great Barrier Reef. All your dreams come true. Number 66. The production designer struggled with lighting the villain's secret lair, and so he asked his old pal Stanley Kubrick for help. He smuggled Stan Kub onto the set, and they spent four hours lighting the place. Number 67. The closing credits originally said James Bond will return in For Your Eyes Only, but because of the success of a small film called Star Wars, Moonraker was shot next in 1979. Number 68. This cable that Jaws is biting through is actually made of licorice. Yummy yummy. Number 69. My god, what's Bond doing? I think he's attempting re-entry, sir. This happened. Number 70. This scene in which Bond and the pilot are fighting for the parachute like it's the last donut in the box was actually shot in freefall. There were so many technicalities involved that this few minute sequence took 88 jumps and 5 weeks to film. Number 71. The budget for Moonraker was more than the budgets of Doctor No, From Russia With Love, Goldfinger, Thunderball and You Only Live Twice combined. And yet they still didn't shoot in actual outer space. Unbelievable. Number 72. In 1981 the Bond film For Your Eyes Only was released, for everybody's eyes, not just yours. Number 73. The film was actually quite progressive because one of the Bond girls, Caroline Cossey, was actually born as a male. This wasn't discovered until after the film was released, but still, way to go, Bond. Number 74? I defy you with delicate in stainless steel! This bizarre line apparently comes from Albert Broccoli, who used to hear the Mafia bribe people in this way. Bond probably wouldn't make a great deli owner anyway, so it's probably best he didn't take him up on the offer. Number 75! Steven Spielberg was interested in directing a Bond film, but the producers said they only wanted British directors to helm the project. He was then offered some small film called Indiana Jones instead. Number 76. Octopussy, the Bond film, not the shady Japanese film that lives on the deepest, darkest corners of your hard drive, slithered its way onto the silver screen in 1983. Number 77. That same year, the unofficial Sean Connery starring Bond film Never Say Never Again was released due to an argument over rights and, you know, to confuse everybody on the face of the earth. Octopussy made $187 million worldwide, whereas Never Say Never Again made $160 million. After this, Sean Connery probably did just say never again. Never again. Number 78. Accompanied by Duran Duran singing at us to dance into fires, which by the way we at 101 Facts do not recommend doing, A View to a Kill appeared onto screens in 1985. Number 79. At just 34% on Rotten Tomatoes, A View to a Kill is the worst critically rated of all the official Bond films. Number 80. Roger Moore turned 906, sorry, I mean 57, during filming. Despite this, he does the dirty dance with four ladies in this film, somehow without the use of a Zimmer frame. Number 81. Ziggy Stardust himself, David Bowie, was offered the role of Max Zorin, but instead it went to Christopher Walken. I mean, come on, that was a good impression. Number 82. 
The Living Daylights was released in 1987, with Timothy Dalton as the new Bond. Pierce Brosnan was originally considered, but he was busy, although something tells me his luck would later change. Number 83. The rocket that fires from the Ghetto Blaster was an effect activated by Prince Charles while he was on set. Whether he kept it for himself for later is unknown, but... I mean, you, you would, wouldn't you? Number 84. Licence to Kill arrived in the Taylor Swift flavoured year 1989, and was the first Bond film to be rated PG-13 in the US of A. Number 85. Benicio Del Toro was a mere lamb at just 21 years old, making him the youngest Bond villain. Number 86. Goldeneye, I told you it would come up again, was released in 1995, debuting Pierce Brosnan in the role, and with a body count of 47, it's the most bloodthirsty that Bond has ever been. Number 87. The tank chase sequence took about six weeks to film entirely. Let's hope Pierce was actually allowed out at some point. Number 88. Tomorrow Never Dies came alive in 1997. This remote controlled car sequence took 10 days, two locations and 17 BMWs to make. Number 89. The World Is Not Enough was released in 1999. The title refers to the translation of Bond's family motto, Orbis Non Sufficit. Number 90. This movie was shot near the real MI6 HQ, who initially wanted to say no because of it being a potential security risk. Pfft, as if James Bond would cause any drama. Oh, right. Foreign Secretary at the time, Robin Cook, urged to overrule this, saying, after all Bond has done for Britain, this is the least we could do for Bond. Number 91. The new shiny, realistic, and Madonna-enhanced to die another day melted into cinemas in 2002. In the beginning of this film, Bond looks like a homeless man. Apparently it took Pierce Brosnan three hours to look like this. As in to have makeup and fake hair put on him, he doesn't normally look like that after three hours. Probably. Number 92. Brosnan expressed dissatisfaction with the final project, saying for the next film they should go with a darker and more grounded approach. In the 2006 reboot of Casino Royale, they did exactly that, just without poor Pierce. Number 93. Daniel Craig was the new Blondie Bond for Casino Royale. He apparently gained 20 pounds of muscle and stopped smoking for the role. He was also the first actor to be nominated for a BAFTA for playing JB. Number 94. The world's most famous virgin, Richard Branson, makes a cameo in this film. Funnily enough, this is edited out of the version that British Airways play on their planes due to their rivalry. Number 95. The confusingly titled Quantum of Solace was released two years later in 2008. It was mocked for its title, but it's actually the title of a short story that Ian Fleming had written decades ago. Number 96. Daniel Craig's fingertip was sliced off during the filming of Quantum of Solace. Crikey, all this talk of actor injuries makes me want to turn down the offer that Sony just made me. Number 97. In 2012, the sky well and truly fell in with Skyfall, which is now the 13th highest grossing movie of all time, at $1.1 billion. Number 98. Daniel Craig lived out all Londoner's fantasies and slid down that escalator himself. He also actually did fight on top of this train. Number 99. Sales of Cutthroat Razors rose by 400% after Skyfall was released, either because of a massive coincidence, or probably because of this scene. I'm guessing a nice lady to shave you isn't included. Oh. Number 100! Daniel Craig said he wanted Skyfall to be his last Bond movie, and that he wanted out of this as soon as he got in, but they wouldn't let him go. Number 101! Spectre is the name of the 24th official Bond film. The rumoured budget for Spectre is $350 million. That's a lot of martinis. That was 101 facts about James Bond, and I don't know about you, but I had a lovely time. If you want more facts, perhaps about dreams or even about wars set in space, you can click on either of these little boxes right now, and you'll be transported there faster than Daniel Craig wants out of his contract. To get all the facts straight to your MI6 branded electronic gadgetry, then click on Rosie the Tarantula right now to subscribe to 101 Facts. I just, I just feel bad for her because this probably made, you know, everybody scared of her and her family and, and coming down from the high of being in such a big movie to being, you know, nothing and everyone being scared of you, I just, I just, I just pity her, I just, I, I feel sorry for her, that's all. Anyway, toodaloo!